2023 was a wild year for technology, and I think 2024 is going to be even crazier. To say I'm excited would be an understatement. There are some really cool trends in technology that I just can't wait to get my hands on the results of. So without further ado, let's talk about what I think will change in 2024 in all of technology. I want to be clear, this is not a video for developers. If you want my takes on how development's going to change over the next year, that video is on my main channel. I'll be sure to link it in the description as well. This is about tech trends, hardware, software, and the things that we use every day. This video is not for software devs. That doesn't mean you shouldn't watch it because there's some really cool technology trends that are relevant to everyone, including devs. I've broken this video up into three sections, software, cameras, and other hardware. I'll be sure to mark them so you can skip between sections if you aren't interested in any one of them. But I'm excited about all of this. So without further ado, let's talk about software. I'll be honest, 2023 kind of sucked for software. As cool as all the AI stuff was, there was a notable trend of things kind of going to shit. And shitification is now a pretty well understood term. And the idea that software gets worse over time as often as it gets better is painfully apparent. I have a whole video about shitification and how 2023 was the end of good software in a lot of ways. I'm really proud of. So check that out if you haven't already. So much beloved software from Discord to Notion to even things like Snapchat have just been adding crazy features and trying to find ways to charge. Netflix killed account sharing. Snapchat added crappy AI features. Notion started charging a lot. Yeah, feels like everything's falling apart. Even Discord has gotten unusably slow and the mobile app is increasingly painful to use. I am not happy with how much software feels like it's eroding as much as it's improving. And a lot of this is because companies aren't incentivized to maintain their software and maintain a good experience. They're incentivized to add new things, to capture new users, to potentially make more money. We're no longer in the era of making the best product we're now in the era of converting your users. And that has changed the quality of software as a whole. And I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Over this next year, I think we're gonna see more and more companies start charging for weird parts of their product. We're gonna see more of these products slow down as the focus shifts away from making a fast functional product and towards making something they can sell and make profit off of. It's gonna suck, I'll be frank but it also is an opportunity for companies to build better, simpler, more focused versions of things. Like we saw with the tool Linear, which took what Jira was doing and made something way more efficient and more pleasant to use. I expect we'll see more and more of these alternatives to existing popular solutions as time goes on that are focused on just being a minimal, performant, good experience. Most of these tools are gonna have to support the browser, which is why the browser wars are more interesting than they've ever been. For the last, I don't know, 10 years, Chrome's just been the standard. And the only real competition has been Safari. Not because Safari is a really good browser, but because iOS doesn't support other browser engines. So even Chrome on iPhones is just using Safari's engine. This is looking likely to change with some recent EU regulations, but right now it hasn't. And as such, Chrome is the major option. What we have seen is more companies building on top of Chrome and the Chromium open source project in order to build different browser experiences. Obviously we have Edge, which is Microsoft's browser. Finally, we're no longer in IE land and we have a real performant engine, Chromium, that is rendering our pages, which makes our lives as developers much easier. But what we don't have is a set user experience. And I'm seeing more and more innovation here. Even Chrome recently pushed a UI update. I think there's a reason they're pushing that though. There's finally real competition. Obviously Edge has some buy-in, Brave was a moment, but Arc is getting really exciting. I'm even using it now. And I never thought I was gonna leave Chrome. I've often made jokes about it. I even have videos that people did not like where I talk about why Chrome is the best browser still. And it probably is. But Arc's user experience is challenging the way I browse the web and manage all of the pages and profiles and things that I do. I think we'll see both Arc finding more success and other options getting more compelling and interesting over the next year because the portal we use to browse the web is more important than it's ever been. And mobile will likely see changes where you could ship a real browser to iPhones for the first time. This is huge and going to fundamentally change the web as a platform and an opportunity to innovate, not just on the API side, but the user experience side. And I for one, I'm ready for some new ways to browse the web. One of the things I'm not ready for is AI being added to everything. I'm already seeing this in stuff like Arc, and obviously this is all over the place in tools like Notion. I like when AI complements things that I'm doing. I don't like when it's being stuffed in at every corner to try and charge me, or worse, when people build whole products and companies around it. AI APIs for other people to integrate, that makes a lot of sense. I don't think open AI is gonna go anywhere. All these new startups that are like Photoshop rebuilt around AI or FL Studio or Word rebuilt around AI, I just don't see those being successful because you can get a lot of the functionality baked into an existing better solution. But if those bigger, better solutions start collapsing under the weight of all the features and developers working on it, it's gonna be an interesting back and forth. 
I just don't see AI first and AI only solutions continuing to get adoption over the next year. I feel like they all hit a plateau relatively early. Speaking of plateauing, we need to talk about live streaming. If you don't know this, I'm actually filming this video live right now. The vast majority of my content is filmed live on stream. Say hi, YouTube. Say hi five seconds later because of the delay. I love filming my content live. I think it's so awesome that I can have my whole community here with me giving me feedback as I record. It has fundamentally changed the way that I produce content. And I think the quality of what I produce is significantly better as a result because I'm not just sitting here alone in a room talking at a camera, hoping I get a good video out of it. I'm getting constant feedback on everything I'm saying and doing so that when I make this video, I'm much more confident in the thing that I'm chopping and eventually releasing. Live as a production method, has been an incredible, incredible tool for me that is a huge part of why I can be as productive as I am with content. That said, I would gladly kill my stream way before I ever killed the YouTube channel, like exponentially earlier. The stream is just a method for content production for me. It's not something that I rely on for community building, as cool as it is. And I don't wanna downplay all of my awesome chatters here. I love all of you and I'm so pumped you're here. You guys make this channel so much better and you make all of these videos way more compelling than they ever would have been otherwise. But this is a way for me to make content. What I've seen a lot of is people who think they can blow up on Twitch or TikTok Live or YouTube Live. I see a lot of people whose expectation is that these platforms are the place to go to grow and make your audience huge. Live streaming platforms are at the bottom of the funnel, not the top. Nobody browses through Twitch trying to figure out who to watch next. And if they do, there's a very high chance they bounce. People browse Twitter, people scroll YouTube, but live platforms are not the right way to discover new content because the majority of the time you go to a stream, it's not one of the hype moments. Even when people come to this stream, they're either coming in in the middle of me filming a YouTube video, which is awkward and strange because you can't really rewind, or they're coming in when I'm planning a video or just talking with my chat, which is way more boring. It is incredibly rare somebody happens to show up in my stream at the same time something interesting is going on, which makes the content really tough to discover and build an audience from. Whereas on TikTok, I can structure a perfect 30 to 70 second thing that is me at my best. So when you scroll it, you're immediately hooked and more likely to come back to my content in the future. Live streaming is not a way to grow your content brand. And I think we're starting to realize that as an industry. Twitch has had fewer streamers streaming fewer hours year over year, and the viewer numbers aren't looking great either. The ability to grow a brand on live is kind of dead. What live is good for is community building once you already have these people, or more importantly for me, content creation, where I have my community as part of the process for making videos, which is incredible. It makes my videos better, it keeps more involved, it results in a much better overall experience. But I don't think we're gonna have more ninjas in the future. And I certainly don't think we're gonna have more Twitches. Twitch is dying. It's incredibly hard to make money in live because live video is absurdly expensive to distribute. And the only advertising platform that's good at video right now is Google's and Google's not really investing in YouTube Live very much. They just finally added chat history. After what, seven years of YouTube Live, I could finally look at the messages you've sent in the past so I know if you're a troll or not. That was added literally today. What the hell? Live is not a real focus for any company other than Twitch and I guess Kick now. And even Kick, their focus isn't live. Their focus is a conversion method for gamblers, not making a really good live streaming platform. And Twitch doesn't know what they're doing. They're, they're trying to figure it out. But ever since they made the discovery feed change on my phone, where I open up the app and it blasts a random moment from someone's stream, instead of letting me look for the streamer I wanna watch, it makes me close the app. I hate using Twitch right now. And that sucks. I think it's gonna keep getting worse. I have a whole video about how live video is dead, but I wanna really emphasize it now. 2024 is the year we stop caring about live video. It's just not interesting anymore. It just isn't. Anyways, on the topic of video, we're gonna get nerdy about cameras for a bit. If you're not into cameras or you just don't care, feel free to skip this section because this is gonna get down in the dirt. It's gonna be get real muddy, real muddy because cameras have been a wild ride recently. If you're not already familiar with my spicy camera takes, I think Sony and Red are evil. <laughs> Red is a patent troll more than they are a camera manufacturer. I have a whole video about that. And Sony, yeah. Sony isn't really trying to make good cameras is the best I can put it. Sony's trying to ship cool technology. And I'm tired of that technology being recommended to people who don't know how any of it works or how to make it a good experience. Thankfully, other manufacturers are taking advantage of this unique opportunity, specifically Panasonic. I think 2024 is gonna be the year where Panasonic becomes the norm for YouTubers again. It was way in the past with the G7 and the GH4, I think, where 
those were two of the first good 4K handheld cameras for filming YouTube videos. And all of my OG YouTube videos were filmed on a $400 Lumix G7 that I bought five years before I started doing YouTube. That's insane. So Lumix had a really good offering. But then as mirrorless technologies continued to progress, as we got full frame, which is a bigger sensor, so more light, better color. As that technology improved, Sony's goal was to make the biggest, coolest sensor and also really good autofocus, which kind of forced me to move to Sony. So I did. And I hated it. My FX30 was a miserable experience. I have a long video about that coming soon. And then Panasonic announced the S5 II. This camera marks a shift in the video camera industry fundamentally, because previously cameras in the two to $4,000 price range would all have some major compromise. The big two things missing on literally every Sony camera are external recording to an SSD. Like you have a USB-C port right there. Why can't I use it? Oh, you sell SD cards. That's why I can't use it. God damn it, Sony. And thing two, shutter angle. Ah. Shutter angle is a different way of doing shutter speed. Shutter speed is how quickly the blind flickers in front of your sensor to take in light. When you're filming video, the general rule is that you should have a 180 degree rotation from your frame rate. To put it simply, if my frame rate is 30 FPS, my shutter speed should be 60 or one over 60 so that the frame is changing twice per actual frame. This is the industry standard for filming. And the way that you could figure that on real cameras is a shutter angle because it's a 180 degree turn from the 30. So 30 should be 60, 60 should be 120, etc. It's just the, the mirroring. It's weird math, but it's called shutter angle. Makes a lot of sense. You want a 180 degree shutter angle from your frame rate in the only camera in a reasonable price range that isn't by black magic that offers this. It's my like Panasonic. I don't know why other companies aren't starting to do this more. Sony has never offered it. So if you change from 30 to 60 or you want to do a quick slow-mo shot, you have to go manually change the shutter speed. And if you forget to change it back, you're now shooting weirdly choppy footage. Why does Sony not offer this one basic feature? I can't tell you, but I can tell you how annoying it is because I just don't change my frame rate on my camera anymore as a result. Ah. The USB-C recording, as I mentioned before, is also huge, which we'll get to in a bit, because this camera, the s 52 x is so good, I bought a second one. I recorded an external SSD. It has a way better menu system, actually a shutter angle. It just kind of works. The color profile on it by default is way better. Their V-Log profile for grading is also way better than S-Log 3. I just don't like the S-Log grading. If you don't have a LUT, you're fucked. Speaking of LUTs, Panasonic also provides a bunch of really awesome LUTs. I, I could go off forever about this camera. I have a whole video coming about it soon. The thing I want to emphasize is that it has made filming YouTube videos way more fun, way more fun. And it's cheaper than the Sony camera I had before. This camera is only two grand and there's a cheaper version that's on sale for like 16 to $1,700. And all you lose is that external SSD. That's so, so good. I cannot recommend any other camera in good faith, especially when we talk about the next really big feature, open gate. It's using a Sony sensor, but it's using more of that sensor. I couldn't find a good diagram of this, so I actually ended up making one. The magic of open gate is that we're not cropping the sensor and losing the top and bottom. Most camera sensors are a lot more square than they are rectangular, but most cameras only let you shoot in 16 by nine. So you're not getting the data from the top and bottom of that sensor. With the S5 II and the S5 II X, you can record open gate, which means you get all of the content from that sensor, which is really cool because you can get a vertical 4K crop out of that. That is nuts. That means that I can shoot once and have a vertical high definition video for TikTok and a horizontal high definition video for everything else and a really nice square if I want to crop that for TikTok or wherever. And since the 4K is such a crop of that 6K, I can zoom a ton and move the camera around in post and have really high quality footage. It's nuts. I have had such a good experience playing with my camera's footage now that I have more space and as content becomes more and more multi-platform and the expectation of 16 by nine continues to die, having a camera that shoots like this is more valuable than it's ever been. And now that there is a camera that supports it, my expectation is more and more cameras are going to adopt this functionality because it just, it's better objectively. And you can add the feature. It's not much more money to add this to your camera. It's just do you or not. Now that it's been added, I expect more and more cameras to copy this. Big trends I'm expecting are more external recording options, way more options around open gate recording for post-processing, and hopefully shutter angle becoming a word that Sony isn't scared of. Speaking of Sony, they just made a pretty big announcement that I am hopeful will start a trend next year. Global shutter. I should probably do a whole video about this. TLDR, rolling shutter sucks. Because of the way these sensors work, they're not actually storing all of the content from the shutter at once. They are going line by line, which means if you're moving really fast as the sensor is saving things, you end up with a shifted image. It's almost like vertically torn where there will be lines or a little bit of wobbliness because of how the sensor picked up the thing that was moving. This has made mirrorless sensors a little less ideal for things like sports photography and movement with your camera. If you have your camera on a tripod like I do here, 
you're fine. If you're trying to get a picture of something moving really fast like a bird, less fine. Rolling shutter happens because, again, each of those lines is processed individually. And there's been a lot of cool advances to try and make it process faster. But what Sony just announced and is hopefully releasing soon is the first mirrorless camera that's a full frame global shutter. So all of the lines update at the exact same time. This camera is focused on photography, specifically sports photography, and it's also $6,000. So it's not something any of us will be touching anytime soon unless you're a camera person, in which case, let me know in the comments. I'd love to chat. But I am excited for a future where that sensor makes it to other cameras. I don't know if that's going to happen in 2024, but if it does, we're going to see a huge change, not necessarily on YouTube, but in film. If a handheld Sony camera or other brand, I don't really care, can shoot that level of quality without having these catches like rolling shutter, the need to shoot on something like a fancy red camera or a fancy Ari goes down a ton. And we'll see more and more films like The Crater that are actually filmed on a handheld Sony camera because you can get shots you can't get with a big rig. I don't know how much of this trend we will see, but I do expect us within the next year to see more and more cameras filmed, not on traditional cinema cameras, but more traditional mirrorless cameras that we would buy for our YouTube videos. And I think that's exciting. And I think it's pretty crazy that any of us could reasonably buy a Netflix certified camera now with all of the innovation going on in the space. Super, super hype stuff. And we wouldn't be done talking about cameras. We didn't talk about the best camera release this year. My iPhone. I'm a little annoyed. I'll be honest. I did not think Apple would get to the point where this is one of the best cameras in the industry. The fact that they filmed an entire keynote with the new iPhone just blew me away. It was not the best looking keynote they've ever done, but it wasn't much worse. And they filmed that on a phone that a lot of people already own. So what did they change that made this so much better? Because it wasn't really the sensor. They changed how we record. The massive wins on the new iPhone are the external SSD recording, which yes, we talked about before. Why are my Panasonic camera and my iPhone the only things that can record to a USB-C SSD? I don't know but it can, so I'm happy. The other thing is log, which means I don't have to take whatever color grading and sharpening Apple likes when I film a video on my phone. I can get a much less processed image and then process it myself in post. The results I've seen from this are absurdly good because I've gotten footage that is basically interchangeable with high-end camera footage, like two to $5,000 camera footage. And I'm not the only one who's saying this. There's a lot of much better camera people who've noticed just how good the new iPhones are. And if you're looking to start making videos, don't buy a fancy camera. Use it as an excuse to upgrade your phone and go do that. If you want to hear more about my takes about what you should use as a creator, I have a long video about that. So go check that out. I'm really excited with the iPhone video camera. I'm expecting more and more people to use that for professional use cases, maybe even clips and real movies in the near future. I'm curious to see how Android catches up because Android is pretty good at photos now. It sucks at video. There is no Android phone that comes even close to a three generation old iPhone in terms of the video quality, stability, and usability. I hope that that changes, but for now, the best video camera experience on a phone by far is the latest iPhones. So if you're looking to film and you want to use a phone for it or you're down to use a phone for it, you should check that out. It's gotten really good. How's that about cameras? Let's talk about the rest of hardware. So I know this is more interesting for the majority of people and we got some big topics in here, specifically Apple Vision Pro. I will be honest, I keep forgetting this is a real product. It feels like Apple's not talking about it that much. Like it gets little updates for developers, but they had their announcement and have been radio silent. There was a lot of pushback when it was initially announced and people even noticed that none of Apple's executives were seen wearing the Vision Pro in any of the marketing material. When they all announced it, they were talking about it with videos playing behind them, but there is no footage of Tim Cook or anyone else that is an exec at Apple actually wearing a Vision Pro. That is interesting because it seems like they're hedging their bet. I hope they don't hedge it too hard though, because I am a huge VR fan. If you don't know this about me, I used to be a globally ranked Beat Saber player. I cared way, way too much about the VR world. I was a day one Oculus Rift owner, the original CV1. I had dev kits throughout the time as well. I have a lot of friends from the VR world. Shout out to Nick St. Pierre, who's now a legendary AI influencer, originally helped create Upload VR, which was one of the first virtual reality journals and places to get info. I love virtual reality. It's so cool what you can do when you use these technologies to, to create real worlds. And I, I love it, even though I barely use it. I have the Quest 3, I have the Valve Index, and they kind of sit right now. The big missing thing is software. The apps I play on my VR headsets are mostly ones that came out in the first year or two of VR catching on. Super hot, Beat Saber. I guess Pistol Whip's a little newer, but it's kind of it for newer stuff. And Tetris Effect, which is just a Tetris game, but okay, Tetris Effect is great. We can talk about that forever, but regardless, the VR apps I'm using are kind of dated, and I haven't seen much innovation on the software side. Like, sure, we got the new Resident Evil or the Medal of Honor games, but that's not exciting to me. I'm not seeing things really 
really challenging the way I consume media and games like I know VR can do. The hardware has gotten incredible. The Quest 3 is like 500 bucks and it's comparably powerful to the Xbox Series S. That's nuts. The quality of experiences you can build for these things is great. And this is why I'm excited for the Vision Pro. I don't think Vision Pro is gonna be great because the hardware is this revolutionary perfect thing. I think it's gonna be great in a lot of the ways the iPhone was, where sure, there were smartphones before the iPhone. There were even touchscreen phones before the iPhone. Some of them even had app stores, but they all sucked. The software was a slog to use. And the iPhone, specifically when they introduced the App Store, created a platform for developers to make really, really great experiences on mobile for the first time. And this is what I'm excited about with the Vision Pro. I think the incentives are greater than they've ever been for developers to make good AR and VR experiences. And with Vision Pro, I am incredibly hopeful we'll see a renaissance in the quality of the tooling and experience for building and playing in VR stuff. My biggest concern is the relationship between Apple and Epic because Epic has the best 3D engine right now. Unreal Engine is the industry standard and it's the industry standard for a reason. It's the best. But because Apple and Epic aren't getting along for reasons that, I'll be honest, are mostly Apple's fault, their partnership has been awkward at best. I don't know what Epic's support of the Vision Pro is going to look like as a result. That said, the need for good experiences, specifically good games on Vision Pro is very real. I don't know if Apple has recognized this yet, but the more they come to terms with it, the more likely they are to enable a platform with incredible new experiences for developers of all forms. Very exciting stuff. But if we're gonna talk about Apple, I think it's unfair to not talk about things that have been hurting them recently. As much as their win against Epic was good for them, they've been having some big losses. First, this was somewhat recent, the Apple Watches Series 8, 9, and all have all been restricted from sales in the United States. If yours breaks right now, they can't legally replace it because they're losing in a patent argument over the heartbeat and specifically the oxygen blood level measurement, which is obnoxious that these patents continue to be used to block innovation and product. Like talk a lot about patents here. We'll talk about them a lot more in the future. From the little bit I've seen, which admittedly, I'm not a lawyer, haven't run into this that much. Seems like this is a patent troll more than a company actually shipping real sensors. And they're going after Apple nonstop. And the only way Apple will be able to keep shipping the watch is if they update it to not have that sensor or they get a presidential pardon, which has been the norm for these types of disputes, which is absurd. I can't believe this is where we're at, but here we are, wild industry. Apple's battles are certainly not just in the US though. In fact, the EU has been a much larger set of issues for Apple lately. The one everyone loves to talk about is the USB-C port that's on my beloved new iPhone. And as cool as it is, this is USB-C, I feel like this case is misrepresented a lot and I actually have concerns for the future and what it represents. You might not know this, but Apple has a pretty solid amount of credit for the creation of USB-C. The 12 inch MacBook, which everyone tooled on for being a one port computer and a terrible netbook future, was actually one of the first devices to ship USB-C in production as its main port. It's one of the first consumer devices with USB-C because Apple pushed really hard to make this port exist. Specifically, really hard to make it take power at high wattages so they didn't have to ship another port just for charging. Remember the days where your computer had a separate port for charging, a separate port for display, a separate port for USB, and a separate port for audio? Having all of that and more in a single port is actually magical. And I understand why Apple pushed as hard as they did to make it the standard. So why didn't they put on the iPhone? Well, if I've learned anything from talking to my parents, is that people don't like change. And the iPhone isn't for the elite, super excited user most of the time. Specifically, the base iPhones are for everyone. And when I told my parents that the new iPhone had USB-C when I was asking for a charger so I could charge my phone when I was visiting them, their response was, wow, Apple's changing the port again? When will this ever end? Lightning is 10 years old, but this mindset of Apple changing the port all the time is very real. And as soon as they change the port, they create a ton of e-waste with all of the things that are lightning first no longer being viable options. That is something they wanted to avoid because they believed the sentiment hit for switching off of lightning was greater than the sentiment win of switching to USB-C. So they were taking their time with it. And my honest expectation is we would have seen the pro phones get USB-C and the non-pro phones stick with lightning for a while. Sadly, the EU had other plans and jumped in and legislated that all mobile phones need to have the same standard port USB-C. This is particularly funny because Apple helped design the port and they were taking their time adopting it in order to not hurt users, but the EU decided they knew better. And as great as it is that we all have a standard port, it also means we now have the best port we'll ever have. We're not going to get a better port on phones in the future because there's no incentive for a company to do that because they probably won't even be able to put it on the phone without having the EU shut them down. This is what scares me about a lot of the EU regulation, yes, 
that's what this point's about, is it takes the current state of things and locks it down in order to make it slightly better. And as cool as it is to have these like five to 10% improvements in our day to day, because our ports are all the same, this comes at a cost of we won't have better ports in the future. Like just imagine for a second that the EU enforced this, not with USB-C, but with micro USB. How many micro USB ports and cables have you broken? Because if your answer is less than five, you're young. Those ports sucked so, so fragile, so unreliable. And we got a better port because Apple wanted a better port. And a bunch of other companies recognized that the existing standard wasn't good enough. But we had Lightning before then because we needed something better than micro USB. And Apple had higher standards than what the USB standard enabled at the time. Micro was awful. USB-C is a great port. But what about the future? Could we have something better? Well, probably won't now. And we're seeing this not just with ports, but with other decisions like the iMessage fiasco, where EU is more and more likely to enforce restrictions around the messaging protocol on iPhones and forcing Apple to support RCS despite it not being encrypted yet. That's chaos. For Apple to be forced to lower the standard for their messaging on their devices because they have a certain threshold of the market is a terrifying precedent. And it's going to disincentivize companies from innovating in these ways. Same deal with the Figma Adobe acquisition. The problem isn't that this big company isn't able to be more successful. The problem is that it changes the incentive structure in a way that won't necessarily benefit the consumer as much. And I'm concerned that a lot of the innovation that we've been seeing in the industry is going to slow down if standards are enforced in a way that makes innovation less rewarding. And I don't want a future where we're not having these technologies improve because we decided that now is good enough. That Apple did try to make specifically FaceTime an open standard and they got patent trolled out of it. They tried really, really hard to do that. And then Vernet X sued them nonstop to keep it from happening. And that's why we don't have an open standard for communication from Apple because things as basic as secure peer-to-peer -peer connections through a DNS is a patent that they lost their dispute on. Making an open standard without the ability to secure a connection over DNS is fucking chaos. So yeah, that's why we don't have an open standard because they were patent trolled out of being able to do it. Anyways, <laughs> whole video about that coming soon. I already recorded it, I seem to edit it. And I have that one for me to edit, which means it's gonna take a while. We have some pushback on the port. So this will get into the video. I'm sorry for calling out this individual, but this is a really stupid take because you don't understand how these things work. How do you think new ports happen? Do they happen because a bunch of companies come together and say, we need a better standard. So we're gonna work together and make this thing. Or do they happen because someone makes something better and then the rest of the industry has to catch up? Because that's how innovation actually actually happens. Innovation doesn't happen because a bunch of people are in a room and are like, yeah, we're all different CEOs that are competing with each other, but we want to innovate on this one thing. Innovation happens because of competition. And if you kill that part, this won't happen. And it's just absurd to me to think that the bigger manufacturers coming together, all of these competitors to make something new unless they're already making better things elsewhere. USB-C happened specifically because micro wasn't good enough. So Apple made something better. And because Apple made something better, the industry had an incentive to catch up and Apple helped lead that with USB-C. The reason that USB-C exists is both because Apple wanted it and because Apple didn't want to wait for it. And if we have to move at the speed of all these companies, we're going to end up with ISPs again. Why is internet not getting better in the United States? It's because there's three internet providers that make that decision and there's no incentive for them to innovate. Uh, this isn't a video about Lightning versus USB-C. This is a video about my concerns of the future of technology. And one of those concerns is that the EU making the decisions for standards is going to result in less improvements to these standards over time. That's just factual. We've talked enough about the things that Apple's doing. Let's talk about one of the things that they haven't really done that is growing more and more as a market. Handheld gaming is a quickly growing market, which is weird because it seemed like it peaked in the Game Boy days. Then the DS had a moment. Then the PSP flopped and we didn't think much was going to happen. The 3DS did not do great either. As an industry, we had kind of decided that the phone was going to be how we experienced games on the go. Thankfully, that's not where it stopped because phones, although they've gotten very powerful, God, don't get me started on how much more powerful an iPhone is than the Switch. Ah, as great as phones are, they're not a good enough gaming platform and Apple has not done enough to embrace gamers as a target audience. This has started to shift with the most recent iPhones. They actually presented Resident Evil on the iPhone at an Apple conference, which is really cool and exciting to see. But the reason they're doing this is because of how much the competition has ramped up. The, the Switch ushered in a new era of mobile gaming. The idea of having console grade graphics in your hand that you can also plug into your TV when you want to challenged a lot of gamers who didn't necessarily think handheld was a good way of playing into trying it out. I know I, for one, thought mobile was a way to play Pokemon and not much else. And I got a Switch because I wanted to play Breath of the Wild on my TV and maybe bring it to work and play it on my monitor. And then I discovered how cool it was having a widescreen 
proper gaming console in my hands. It was almost more immersive to have it that much like closer to me as part of my experience. And I ended up much preferring playing games on Switch almost whenever I could. And this is why I was a day one purchaser of the Steam Deck, because I love the idea of having all of my PC games and a much higher frame rate and better experience overall and a more powerful chip in my hands. And I didn't like the Steam Deck that much. It was really impressive what it could do, but from the two-ish hour battery life to the much worse screen when I was used to my Switch OLED screen, meant that I was reaching for my Switch much more and my Steam Deck way less. And yeah, I have huge hands, so I thought the Steam Deck's grip and shape would be fine. It's not my favorite. I actually much prefer my Switch with a grip on it than I prefer my Steam Deck. I ended up selling my deck, and soon after, the Steam Deck OLED got announced. I found myself missing my Steam Deck more and more, so I gave it a shot, and it is my favorite console possibly ever. The Steam Deck OLED seems to just be a screen swap, so why do I like it so much more? There was actually a slight change in the manufacturing of the processor, which is an AMD x86 chip. It used to be seven nanometer, now it's six nanometer. Doesn't sound like a big deal, it's not any faster, but it's way more efficient. I'm able to get eight plus hours of gameplay on less intense hardware-wise games, and easily over four hours on more intense things. That's incredible, and it let me do a whole long distance flight with one battery charge. And I'm having so much fun playing games, both old and new, on my Steam Deck. And because this is now a standard and more and more people own them, companies are recognizing both PC as a better platform for publishing, as well as lower spec PCs as a thing worth supporting. There's now more incentive than ever for a company to make a game that runs well on a beefy giant 490 Ti computer, as well as on a little thing you can fit in your hands. And it's allowed for both indie devs and big studios to rethink how and who plays their games. It's also opened up PC gaming to a whole market that would never have tried it before, much less on Linux. Yes, the Steam Deck runs Linux and it plays PC games. So cool. This is a monumental shift in gaming. And what we're gonna see as a result is both more and more developers targeting handheld PCs and lower performance platforms. We're also gonna see a pushback from Nintendo and from Apple because they're the incumbents being challenged here. Apple now has to care about mobile gaming if they want any chance of competing with the Steam Deck. And Nintendo needs to stop using a nine-year-old processor in their goddamn Switch. What the hell? The processor was two years old and bad when they shipped the Switch initially, and it has been seven years since. What the hell? We need a Switch that doesn't have a chip that's ancient. But Whatever, the rumors for the Switch 2 have been really good. I have them on pretty good record that it's coming soon and can play 4K60 Breath of the Wild. Exciting, can't wait for it. We need it now. <sighs> One last thing that we touched on a little bit there is architecture for processors. This is probably the nerdiest we're gonna get other than the whole camera section, but processor architecture has been in a crazy place for the last, I don't know, eight to 10 years. This all starts with a company we know as Intel and the pain of using Intel for almost anything. Intel built x86-64 chips for computers so that we could have good experiences with these big beefy machines. And a big part of the x86 standard was optimizing all the different things you might do with a processor. The actual instructions, which you can almost think of these as the pipes you set things down in the processor. The number of different instructions that x86 supports is absurd. There are so many different things like types of weird division, weird mathematical stuff that a given x86 processor supports where you just call that one thing and it spits out the number. That is great because it means any individual instruction can be pretty well optimized, but it sucks because as you make the chips more powerful, you have to support all of these different behaviors in all of these different places. And in a world where we're moving away from one big, super powerful chip towards lots of small chips that are well architected together, that architecture isn't great. And what we're seeing now is a shift away from x86-64 towards ARM, because ARM, as a reduced set of instructions, ends up being much better to scale and also way more power efficient. Apple uses ARM for their standard for chips. ARM is a standard that is based on another standard we'll talk about in a bit that is licensable and used by a lot of companies trying to build faster chips. Also, specifically, more performant and energy efficient chips. The reason you get way better battery on your iPhone than you do on an older MacBook is because that iPhone has a chip that uses way lower wattage and gets really good performance for it. Historically, the phones and the iPads used Apple's chips and the computers used Intel chips. Over time, Intel's chips were not moving fast enough. Specifically, when Apple shipped their famous 12-inch USB-C laptop, they tried the Intel M3 chip. It's funny it was named M and that Apple now has their own M3, whatever. This laptop was magical, despite the keyboard issues, which I'm sure will be held against them forever. It was so cool having a laptop that thin that could do most things. The issue was that it had no fans and it was using an Intel chip. Despite Intel's best efforts to make something efficient enough to throw in a tiny laptop, they didn't do a great job and that computer chugged. I had one, it was rough. I had a 2000-ish dollar laptop that was slower than my iPhone and Apple recognized that and after battling it out with Intel over and over, they kind of gave up. They decided to push their chips into computers. As we all now know, that was the right decision because the Intel M-series laptops 
changed computing forever and pushed a massive shift away from x86-64 over to ARM. And this has resulted in massive change in the industry. As much as ARM has changed things, I do expect them to change a little more because of the system ARM is based on. Ever heard of RISC? RISC, Reduced Instruction Set Computing. RISC is a really, really cool open standard for developing processors. And RISC V is a super, super compelling industry standard that lots of big, powerful companies are teaming up to make a reality. ARM was originally built around an older RISC standard, and they added all of the necessary things to make it more compelling for low power devices. And as a result, ARM got well adopted and is now a big industry standard. RISC is making a ton of progress, though. And although I don't expect 20 2024 to be the year where it becomes a standard, I expect us to see it more and more and the groundwork for risk to become big, to be laid out. I've already seen a great Linus Tech Tips video where they actually bought a risk computer, which yes, you can now get a full desktop computer that runs Linux on a chip that's open source. That's so cool. That's awesome. The idea that something is foreign and locked down as a processor can now be open standard and adoptable by anybody and any company can manufacture the right chip for their use case is huge. It's important to note that these RISC chips, as well as most ARM chips, they have a reduced set of things that they do. So even if they can do more cycles, the amount of things they can do in a given cycle is less. As such, the emulation of x86 programs and all of the things that we used to do is a bit different. And the way that we build our game engines, our software development tools, and the things that actually communicate with the processor, those will have to change a little bit. But the change has been happening because of ARM. My big bold prediction, and the reason I put this in the video, is that Apple's adoption of ARM processors on their computers and across their whole suite of products has accelerated the adoption of reduced instruction software tools massively. If you're building software for Macs and you don't support the new chips, you're mocked now. And all of the things we're doing to support ARM better in these pieces of software will also help us support RISC in the future too. And now that we've gotten into our heads that we need tools that support reduced instruction sets, we're going to see more and more software that does that. And I actually think there's a future where RISC chips become the norm, not necessarily for our Apple computers and phones, but for a lot of other things, for all the sensors we have around our house, for the chip inside of our TVs, for the technology that they're building different like handheld game consoles and things like GPUs on top of. Reduced instruction set computing as an open standard is absolutely the future. I don't know if we'll see it more in 2024 or 2034, but it is happening now and I'm really excited for it. I think that's all I have to say about the future right now. What do you think? What in here did I say that you disagree with the most and why is it the EU stuff? Because I, I know what these comments section look like nowadays. Let me know what you think the future looks like because I am genuinely curious and I think 2024 is going to be a wild year. Appreciate y'all a ton as always. I'll see you in the next one. Peace nerds.